My name is Amber Phillips and I am a student lead for OHIO and our mission is to foster tech culture at The Ohio State University and beyond. So events like this one are essential as we strive to support technology, innovation and entrepreneurship. Um, tonight we will have Dr. Mike Van Putty speak on the importance of information security and multidisciplinary education. So afterwards we will also hear from a panel of experts and Dr. Van Putty, whenever you're ready, the floor is yours. Thank you so much for coming tonight. Uh, so to give you a little bit of my background, I uh, graduated from Ohio State. My wife and I are both students here. Um, uh, I was in business administration, uh, MIS. My wife was social work. Uh, and I was in ROTC. So uh, uh, 20 years uh, after I graduated, I was retired from the Army. Um, the first seven years was in uh, as a combat engineer, so jumping out of airplanes and doing young men's things. Uh, the last 13 years was doing cybersecurity, cyber warfare. Um, so that's what I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk about. Uh, a few of my jobs in that field, I uh, was the director of the Army's Artificial Intelligence Center. Um, I was uh, uh, deputy director of operations for what now is called US Cyber Command, so we were responsible for defending Pentagon networks as well as attacking other people's networks. Uh, and I spent four years at DARPA doing research and development. That was a blast. Uh, it's another discussion we'll have to have sometime. Uh, but uh, uh, what I'm going to talk about now, well, and then start a business and, and was very successful. And now I came back to Ohio State, so it's, it's my chance to get back to the university. Um, but what I want to talk about is something that happened 25 years ago. Uh, I was teaching at the Army War College, and one of the courses I was teaching was called Advanced Technologies for the Military Leader, or as we called it, Computers for Colonels. Um, and so this is teaching senior military officers, become general officers. And I was teaching a course that was that particular day on cryptography, which is the math and science of sending and receiving secret messages. So I gave a lecture on how you can take a message and using a special application and a key that you generate, you can wrap that message up and nobody will be able to read your message uh, without having that key. And it will take longer than your lifetime to figure out what that key is using the most powerful computers. So I got done with the talk and you know, I was feeling really good about myself. Good guys won, bad guys zero, we win. Technology is awesome. And I asked my, net, my guest speaker to come up. And my guest speaker was Frank Height. Now Frank Height is not a college graduate, but he's one of the world's top hackers. He's brilliant. He now owns a business in San Francisco, very successful. Uh, but at the time, uh, he was very long hair, dressed a little disheveled. Um, and he came in to speak to this office, this room, classroom full of military officers. And he told me later, we looked like a bunch of Christmas trees. Well, we're wearing green and shiny things. And, um, so he, he was embarrassed, uh, or not embarrassed, but he, was, he felt awkward. Um, so he got up. Pulls out his ponytail and he flips his hair down and he flips it back and it's just massive hair. And he said something that changed my life and actually changed the whole path of my, my career. He said, everything Mike said is true and none of it matters. Because somebody could go, uh, he explained that I was thinking like a mathematician, like a scientist, like an engineer. I wasn't thinking like a hacker. So he would take and he demonstrated how he could break into a government computer, and it took him all of maybe 15 seconds, and then he could change the key, or he could change the app, or he could delete the app so that I could no longer encrypt my messages and then do something that's called shepherding. I can't use a secure method, so now I have to use an insecure method like text or email or something that he could read. So all my message and all, all the science and, and everything that I thought was beautiful was actually just this, this false security that I was living in. Now, you probably think, well, that was 25 years ago. Certainly things have changed since then. And it has. Every year for the past 15 years, uh, the amount of crime reported to the FBI, cybercrime, has gone up by 100% over 15 years. 2021, the last year that the FBI reported numbers, they haven't reported 2022 yet, um, $7.2 billion we lose to cybercrime in the United States. And it goes up 100% every year. That's a great investment if you're looking at uh, something to invest in. Um, and if you doubt how cybersecurity, how, you know, how good cybersecurity is, consider 
Every time you're forced to take those online classes that tell you don't click on an attachment or don't do something on social media. So you're going to do something on a computer that some engineer en enabled you to do. He built a system to make, allow you to do that. But if you do it, you'll lose all your information and possibly your entire organization's information. That's how good of a field computer security is. Um, or as I tell my students, we can never guarantee job security, but you will have, or we can never guarantee security, but you will have job security. <laughs> so if you talk to vendors, you talk to defense contractors, you talk to consultants, uh, or you talk to politicians, they're going to tell you we need to double down. We need to spend more money. We need more investment. We need more technology. We need to look to the future. But the future will not save us. Um, you actually need to look to the past. So as an engineer now and an entrepreneur, um, let's go back into my, we're going to step into my time machine and let's go back to the past. And the first place we're going to stop is 1936. And we meet a mathematician, Alan Turing. He's 22 years old, just got his bachelor's degree. And he's really interested in what kind of mathematical problems he can solve with a computer. The only problem is a computer hasn't been invented yet. And no one even knows what one will look like. So the first thing he has to do is come up with a theory of how a computer will work. And he does it. He comes up with something we would later call a Turing machine, which is a mathematical model for how a computer works. And it's the same model we use today for every computer. But that's not all. He just, he did not only invented the field of computer science, um, but he proves mathematically that any problem a human can solve can also be solved by a computer. He invented the field of artificial intelligence. And again, 24-year-old mathematician, you know, wow, bachelor's degree. But that's not all. He shows that there are certain classes of problems that cannot be solved by computers. It's impossible. It doesn't matter how much time, memory, speed, it can't be solved. One of them is called the halting problem. It's impossible to build a computer program that can take as input another computer program and tell you if that will ever stop. That's all it is. Can't be solved, impossible. The proof is up to you. Please turn again on Carmen by Monday. Um, <laughs> what does that have to do with anything? We'll get to that. So let's step back into our time machine. So now we're in 1940. The world is at war. So people are trying to figure out how do we defeat Germany. And Germany has this really cool communication system. It would be called the Enigma. Some of you may have heard it, the imitation game, uh, uh, what's his name? Benedict Cumberbatch. If you've seen the movie, it's cl really close to the truth. There are some discrepancies, but it's really close. It's a good, it's a movie about a mathematician, so this is cool. Um, so what happens? The Germans have this, this thing that looks like a typewriter. You roll, set some de wheels, you set some pins, that's your key. And the Germans say, this is unbreakable encryption. I can send any message in secret, except that they have a bug in the program, in the, in the typewriter, it's mechanical. And they have a bug in how they use it. So thanks to the Poles, and then the French, and then the British, they figure out that they can actually break a few of these messages. They do it all by hand. So here enters Alan Turing. Wait, I got this idea for this computer. So. What does he do? He builds a computer, the first computer. And they start breaking these messages, and they're able to read where German U-boats are, and where German planes and submarines, where German planes are, and what their plans are. And he's credited with ending uh, the war two years early and saving 14 million lives. It's pretty good. It's like 30 at that point. OK. Uh, so let's step back into our time machine. So now we jump to 1960s, and we have this organization called DARPA, or ARPA, Advanced Research Projects Agency. And they do all the high-risk, high-payoff research for the government. And at this point, we have computers, but they can't talk to each other. So we have to figure out a way to make these computers share information. So they come up with this language that allows any computer to talk to any other computer. And it was called ARPANET. And ARPANET becomes the NSFNet, National Science Foundation, and NSFNet becomes the Internet. And so now we have any computer can talk to any other computer, except that it was a research project. And everybody trusted each other, and everybody knew each other, and there were no secrets. So there's no, se and there's no security built into the internet at all. That's how we got there. One last time in the time machine, and we'll finish up. We jump in, go to 1983, and there's this guy, Fred Cohen. 
And Fred is really interested in viruses and how they infect people and living creatures. And he says, I'm going to do my master's thesis on a computer virus. So the, it has three parts. The first part is a mathematical discussion of what a virus is and how it would work in a computer. The second part is an actual virus and how, uh, two of them, and how and they run on a PDP-11 computer. That's an old computer. And the third part is a proof. And the proof says, if I build a computer program that can detect any virus, then I can solve the halting problem. Alan Turing's halting problem. I can't solve the halting problem. It's impossible. Therefore, it's impossible to build perfect antivirus. You can't be done. It's impossible. The best you can do is every time you see a new one, you have to update your antivirus. And that's why you all have to update your antivirus every week, every day, because there are constantly new viruses. And engineers would say that other problems are similar. For example, um, it's impossible to build a computer program that can detect all bugs in computer code. It can't be done. It's impossible. Or detect bad guys in the network. Or do perfect forensics. It can't be done. The computer security field is a $260 billion a year industry built on myth, metaphor, and wishful thinking. And it's my field that I teach. Um, <laughs> So what do we do? How do we solve it as a field? What can we do about it? The first thing is we need to teach our engineers and MIS students about the limits of technology. If you're a computer science major and you don't know who Alan Turing is or Fred Cohen, it's kind of like being a physicist and not knowing who Isaac Newton is. They're the father of our field, and if you don't understand the limits of what your technology is, how can you explain that to, to your bosses, to your customers? The second is, we teach our engineers to think like Thomas Edison, design, build, test. Uh, but that's not how hackers think. When you're driving down the street, you see two yellow lines in the middle of the road. What do you think? Don't cross. Danger. I see paint. It's just paint. It's not stopping me from doing anything. How do we teach our, hacker, or how do we teach our computer security people to think like hackers so they can outthink them? Because you can't outcode them. We need to make them think like James Bond. And how do we do that? We need courses or a course that teaches things like psychology, deception, uh, counter, uh, uh, personal deception, self-deception, things like cognitive biases that make you make the bad decisions and act irrationally without knowing it. Uh, economics, game theory, and strategy. Because as a, as a hacker, I, think, I try to think four or five steps ahead of you. And if you're a cybersecurity person and you're just responding to things, I'm always going to be one step ahead of you. And the last is we need to teach business to engineers. Because it's right now, in the latest survey, that's the biggest shortcoming in computer security. They don't understand the business. It's easy to make a computer secure. Unplug it, drop it in a well. <laughs> Game over. Um, but your job is to make, uh, enable a business to work securely, not make it secure. Um, and then last, as business uh, managers, as all of you, you need to think about the limits of computer security. I cannot guarantee you security. Cannot be done. I don't care if you pay me a million dollars or you jump up and down and scream and yell. Cannot be done. I prefer the million dollars, by the way. Um, and be careful of the false sense of security the vendors are going to give you. So consider if you need to put everything you have on the network? Do we need to take our most sensitive systems, our proprietary code, and put it on the same network as a Wi-Fi coffee pot? God only knows what code is actually running on that, and it's all connected to the internet. And no matter who you are, there's somebody out there who wants to get what you've got. Um, and con consider these limitations on security. It's not just your laptop. This is the, the control systems running the electrical power grid. It's the nuclear power plant. It's every AI system, and it's your self-driving cars. They all have the same limitations. That'll keep you up at night. And lastly, um, have a healthy bit of skepticism for what's out there. Um, you know, that's perfectly fine when you're online. Uh, if you can't trust the identity of the person you're talking to, or uh, what they're telling you, how do I verify that? Uh, then, you know, Maybe having a healthy level of skepticism and be it safe, take it a few extra seconds before you respond uh, is perfectly fine. That's all I have.
Dr. Van Pati. Thank you so much for that insight. Multi multidisciplinary education is so important to us, so thank you for that. I would just like to introduce our panel. Um, we will have a panel of experts who will be sharing advice on what they wish they would have known at the beginnings of their entrepreneurial journeys. So we will be joined by Cheryl Turnbull. She will be our panel moderator this evening. She's the senior director of the Keenan Center. And we will also be joined by Megan Neff, the director of venture development at Rev1 Ventures. Dr. Jeff Spitzner, the founder of DNA Nanobots and many other outstanding tech ventures will also be joining us with Dr. Arnav Nandi, a professor at Ohio State and the founder and CEO of MobyKit. And thank you everybody so much. Um, is everybody done with the QR code? Yeah. <laughs> okay, everybody, thank you so much. Um, the floor is your guys'. Cheryl Turnbull, responsible for the Keenan Center for Entrepreneurship, and um, I'm very excited to have this august panel with me, um, our startup um, experts and entrepreneurs. So I'm going to start off just first, I know um, Amber gave a quick intro for each of you, but I'm going to have you give like just another like two or three minutes on your backgrounds because they're incredibly interesting and I want our um, audience to get to know you a little bit more. So Arnab, why don't you start? Um, sure. Um, I'm Arnab. I, uh, I work on big data and uh, I've been uh, both an academic and an entrepreneur um, since, uh, since pretty much high school, um, building things uh, like websites. Um, I didn't know I was doing a startup when I was an undergrad. I just thought it was a project and then it's He's related making money. to Alan Turing. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so, um, so yeah, I, 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 I like building things um, and uh, I like building software and also organizations, um, um, including OHIO, which is uh, something that I've done with a lot of you around here. Um, but uh, I'll, I'll mention a few other things uh, during this panel, but that's, that's it for me for now. Uh, well, I'm, I'm Jeff Spitzner. I did my PhD here at Ohio State University, molecular cancer research and bioinformatics. Went on to MIT to do my postdoc work. As I finished that up, I realized for me, if I, if I was actually going to change the world, for me, so I had to move out of academics and bring exciting new products to market. And so I decided to come back here where I was doing my software development. And I've been here for 20 some years now, starting um, about 10 different companies and learning a lot along the way, raising money, hiring great people, working with great people, helping what I can to build this community. It's been fantastic. Hi everyone, my name is Megan Neff. Um, I am an Ohio State alum and a native to the Columbus, Ohio area. Um, my background is in healthcare, so I have been uh, in pharma, management consulting for healthcare, as well, well as medical device commercialization. So really focused on strategy, development, execution. Um, which is great, you know, with my role at Rep1, focusing on life sciences clients and really helping them go from concept to developing business models and establishing product market fit. Um, I'm really passionate about making things happen and helping people figure out how to make their dreams happen and build their companies. So excited to speak with you this evening. Thanks all. So all of these incredibly successful people, you see like where they started and you see that they've ended up here and they're absolutely amazing and incredible. And so we're gonna just like burst that bubble just for a second. And we're gonna, I'm gonna start off by asking you, what is a mistake that you made when you first started your entrepreneurship journey that you think, you know, you could help save someone else from making the same mistake? And this is first because we all know these guys are pretty perfect, so it's gonna be tough to think of this, but. Um, so the, the most, uh, the one that immediately came to mind um, is to not start soon enough. Um, a lot of us have this, if only X happens, then we will do Y, and it's this logic construct that we have in our head, where we say, if only there was enough money, if there was somebody who 
wrote a check that we get started, or if only I had the right skills, and maybe in a year I'll have the right skills for it, and I'll get started. Um, so that if X, then Y allows us to sort of bury our dreams for a little bit, and then you get old, and then eventually leave. Um, and so that's basically the big mistake, is to, that I didn't start a lot of things that I wanted to start soon enough because I had that if-only construct and then eventually I started removing it, so, yeah. Let's say the biggest, probably continuous mistake I find is, is that you identify, you, you know market pretty well, you know the people doing it, you identify a really important problem and you, you work really hard, you, you raise money, you, get, you have scientists and engineers and software developers working really hard, make a great solution to that problem and then only to discover, in fact, it's your customers all agree that you've done a great job of solving the problem, but it's just not high enough on their priority list that they want to pay to solve that problem. So I think the biggest challenge in you know, high success for all startups is, is finding out that the soonest thing you have to do, even before you decide whether or not to jump off and start that startup company, is find out if you're, who your actual customer is, who's actually going to identify the problem, who's going to write the check, and find out if, if you did solve the problem in the way that you think to solve it, if they will pay you money to solve that. I have a two-part response. Um, one, I think to Jeff's point, is customer validation. Really making sure that you have a market for your product and solution, and you have people that are, one, willing to use it, and willing to buy it, and sometimes those are not the same groups of people, more often than not, especially in healthcare. Um, and then the second piece, you know, from an advising standpoint and working with startups, startup founders are not all the same. And what I've found is you really need to meet people where they are, figure out what, you know, ways to motivate them, frameworks to help them kind of facilitate their progress, what works best for them. Um, no entrepreneur is the same. Okay, so um, I'm going to backwards this time we'll start with Megan's. Um, we're gonna we're, I want you to rate um, there, there's three factors that come into play in a startup company and let's call them the team, the technology, and the funding. What do you think is the most important? Well that's a great question Cheryl. <laughs> I will give my opinion for the uh, very early concept stage, um, I think the team is going to outweigh the technology very, very early on. You need people to work hard and being willing to put in the time and effort to answer the questions. But the technology and having something that actually addresses a market need is a very, very close second. Jeff, what do you think? Well, I think also that I'd have to pick the team first because teams typically figure out how to overcome the other barriers. But if you don't have the right team, the technology is never going to solve its own problem. And it's, it turns out it's easy to spend money on the wrong things just as easily as the right things. So I think if you have the right, the right people in place and the right expectations among the team, the other problems are not easier to solve, but they're solvable. I don't think if you don't have the right team to start, you probably can't fix that. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more with both of you. So, yeah, by, by a large margin team. Um, technology has a very short lifespan, um, especially with trends that have happened since December till now. So we're talking a span of four months. Um, things have fundamentally changed in terms of what is possible and not in terms of um, the advances in AI lately. Um, and so, uh, you know, technology will come and go and it will keep moving and you can solve a lot of things eventually. Uh, but the people that will do, the, do that with you, um, that, that is just crucial. Um, funding, um, I think you rightly pointed out, it's very easy to spend money. Um, so with the right kind of people, you will be able to spend it very quickly as well. So, um, so, so yes, a team would be by far the easiest uh, answer. You know, that's really interesting because I think there's this myth around the successful entrepreneur and you view that as a single person and it really is, um, this is a team sport. 
Um, it's one of the reasons why all the resources exist here at Ohio State to support you is because we recognize that team is very important. Um, and it's not, and it's the people you surround you with. It doesn't necessarily have to be on your cap table or your organization chart, but they're the people around you that can provide you and help uh, with and help with resources, advice, etc. Um, I will also say that technology, I think, is kind of interesting in that it has enabled us to do things that at one time um, only large companies could do. And that's really sort of generated a, I think, surge in entrepreneurship. So I guess I like maybe Jeff, you start off. Um, you know, you've been working in some really interesting spaces around cancer and such. How do you see technology enabling a startup culture in a startup community? Well, I think it's two things. One, as you say, is that the things you can do in a startup mode, 10, 20 years ago, you couldn't do. You, you, things that could, they used to cost tens of millions of dollars, you could now do for a fraction of that. There, there's so many publicly available tools, there's tool sets, there's, there's an enormous amount of, that you can accomplish on a small scale. So I, I still think it's, it's about identifying the right problems to solve, not driving your tool forward regardless of, of what awaits ahead, but understanding what problem you're trying to solve and figuring out what, if, if the platform you've licensed to the university, for example, is the right one, or maybe you know, sometimes you, you start out with a company and you realize that your goal is to solve a, a problem, not necessarily to push for a particular technology. And I think the, that the whole industry supports that kind of growth. So I think there's so many tools. In many cases, the best way to learn about new things is network. Find out, you know, when you're, if you just live inside your lab all the time, you may not know what the competitors are doing, what, the, what your customers are doing, and, I think it's really important just to go get out there and talk to people, find out what, how they're looking at problems, how they're solving the problems, and realize that the key thing that the small companies have is, is agility. That a, that a big company, a pharma company, it takes them, can take them a year to make a decision. Whether it's a good decision or a bad decision, it can take them a year to make a decision. In a startup company, you may have gone through your entire life cycle by then. So I think the key thing is, is this, this relates also to my other kind of strategy about startup companies. The important thing, like for executive side, is to, be able to just make pretty reasonably informed decisions quickly, understand the difference between the great and the good. As a startup, you can't be great at everything. You have to pick out a couple things you're going to be great at. Everything else, you have to be just good enough to get move forward. And that's your competitive advantage is that you can get a tremendous amount of things done week after week after week using those new technologies, old technologies, innovation gum, staples, string, whatever you need to get things done. <laughs> I will echo some of Jeff's comments. Um, I think agility is huge. I think, you know, generally there is, you know, an appetite and a need to uh, continuously innovate in the environment that we're in today. And I do think that you know, what I've seen, um, at least in healthcare, is that large um, corporations or incumbents are really looking to the startup ecosystem for these new innovative ideas to solve problems where, you know, like Jeff said, they might have been able to do that internally or think of that idea internally, but the startup is going to be able to bring that existing infrastructure and something that the um, larger organization may be able to leverage long term. Yeah, and, and to piggyback on uh, Jeff's point about uh, agility. Um, so one of the things to think about with the startup is uh, what startup means that you're trying to beat an incumbent, right? And the, otherwise it would just be a small business or a company. Um, and that de by definition means that you're trying to beat a larger thing, right? So there's a David versus Goliath type uh, equation here. Um, and at that point, technology is a necessity. You don't have any other option. Uh, this is the only you know, tool in your arsenal that you can use to force multiply yourself and try to beat something that has, just by definition, more resources and a larger size. Um, so think of technology as the exoskeleton that you put on before you go into battle, right? Because it gives you superpowers. Um, so that's, that's how I would, be, I would view it. 
So with all of the superpowers and all this fabulous stuff, one of the things that I think is really difficult is just kind of maintaining your mental well-being and your life balance as an entrepreneur. It's very much of a roller coaster ride. It's not that straight line. Um, what advice do you have for um, entrepreneurs who need to take care of themselves but may also have to take care of employees and their, you know, whose paychecks are depending on them? How do you, how do, you do that? One of, them, one of my former employees is right here, so I was just like looking at him. I hope he's happy. Um, he doesn't look like he's challenged, so that's good. <laughs> look healthy. <laughs> uh, sorry to put that in but um, mental well-being is priority number one um, for the founder and every single person in the company. Um, without that, you are not going to be able to survive. Um, this is a roller coaster, so um, the actual analogy I like to use is that if you were going to participate in an extreme sport, you get a coach. Right? Like every athlete has a coach, um, and then you focus on being well before you start competing. Um, why should this be any different? So my biggest recommendation to every uh, one that starts a company is get a therapist immediately. Um, and uh, not for the fact that you have a problem, but because you want to make sure that you are centered and you're performing at peak performance, right? So this is more about making sure you're doing well um, as opposed to saying, oh, I'm in trouble. And then you go and have a problem later on and then seek, seek uh, advice. And so, um, so making sure that you're mentally in peak performance, uh, just like you think of physical fitness, uh, mental fitness is a very, very critical consideration. Well, I certainly agree that, that the, the mental, the mental well-being of, of the executives, of the entire team is really important to success as well as, I mean, happiness is sort of hard to measure, but success is easy to measure. And I think all the studies show you need successful people are able to, to balance it out. And, and, and Michelle said, well, we live unbalanced lifestyles because many, many of entrepreneurs are a little bit unbalanced. That, but that, that's okay. As long, I think for many people, they have to know themselves and know what about that they can share with their teams. Because people, you know, sometimes, you like as, as a CEO, sometimes you find out a year or two one past when you should have that your employee is dealing with an issue you didn't know about that you could have helped. You could have, whether it's, so sometimes it's just encouraging good one-on-one -on -one conversations because one of the strengths of a company is that not everybody has to be there necessarily all the exact same hours. So you figure out, if, let's say you have an employee who has to get kids to school, well, tell them that, they, that their job, number the first job is to get the kids safely to school before they worry about getting to work. They're probably gonna do better during the day. If they're dealing with some stress at home or a, an illness in the family, you know, figure out how to help them take the time they need to do that. And everybody, I think, needs to, everybody needs to find hobbies as much as as much as the startup world might take 60, 80 hours a week, you still have to carve out some room for things that are that are not productive at all, just to, to, to settle the mind. I will add uh, to those comments, um, you know, mental health therapy, uh, it's so important, and finding the hobbies. I think finding those things that really enable you to unwind and relax and, you know, feel energized again, whether that's drawing, writing, running, uh, rock climbing, whatever, you know, finding those hobbies that really make you feel good. Um, and, you know, encouraging that dialogue with your team as a founder and leader on the team. Um, another thing that I think is so important that, you know, is sometimes can be overlooked when you're moving so fast is just communication. Just having clear, concise communication Brene Brown has a saying um, that it's clear as kind, and I firmly believe that. I just, as a team, you know, communicating as much as you can, as clear as you can, and that way everyone understands where you're going um, and why you're doing what you're doing. That way you can really come together and kind of work towards a common goal. Thanks, and I, I think one of the things that um, entrepreneurs do really well is that their definition of failure is different. Um, I think you know we as a society view failure as being something that's bad. You didn't make something happen. You weren't able to achieve something. And I think entrepreneurs look at it as a learning opportunity and a chance to try something different with their new knowledge. 
So I think that that really helps a lot as we view ourselves as to say, okay, we're, we're not a failure, that this thing we did didn't work, so we're gonna try something else. So we really try to, I guess, emphasize that piece of the equation. I know we have a few, just a few more minutes, I understand, um, but maybe, so just as a uh, last word, I will um, ask each of our panelists to say the one thing, the thing that they think is most important to them as, a, as the, a, the characteristic that they have as an entrepreneur that's allowed them to be successful. Um, so just to have a, I like to think of this as a, like a systemic version of thinking of risk and rejection, um, is that your, your rejections don't define you. Um, is a very important thing to internalize. It's extremely hard, um, but um, if you are trying to do something meaningful, you will face a, like a mass fire hose of constant rejection uh, because people will not understand what you're talking about in the first place and then eventually you'll get them. Um, so being able to manage rejection um, at a systems level, saying there's gonna be 50 of these and then the 51st will be an accept um, um, is probably the biggest one takeaway. Yeah, I have to say, for me, it, it, it's just eternal optimism. Optimism doesn't mean you don't expect failures, it just means you expect success. That it doesn't matter how many times you, you, know, you roll the, you flip the coin into the tails, eventually it's gonna come out heads. And so the optimism is just waiting for that moment to happen. And I think as long as, you know, to me, the key thing is always thinking that, you know, you have some bad things may happen, but you're gonna get to, you're gonna get to a point where you, you win, you succeed, and you just have to keep thinking about that moment and, and that's what keeps everything else going. I would say mine's probably similar to Jeff's. Um, really appreciating the good days and the good momentum and knowing that the bad days and the hard times are not gonna last forever. Well, thank you all. Give a big hand up. You all have tons to learn from them and I appreciate all that you've, you've given us. And now I think we're gonna find out who are all right, so. Before uh, we do that, I just want to give a shout out to all the organizers over here. If you're an organizer, current organizer, can you please raise your hands? Also, if you're an alumni of OHIO and ever had to organize and have come back for this event, please raise your hands. Thank you for this. This is the fifth show of Ohio, so thank you all. just like to say thank you so much to our panel. It is so amazing to hear all of the expertise you guys have to offer everybody in this room. Thank you so much. Um, and with that, since this is OHIO's last event of the academic year, I would like to, invent, er, to invite our program director, Cal King, to recognize our graduating OHIO leaders. So I was gonna get up here and say, Thanks to all of the organizers, and thanks to the alumni. Um, but thank you, Arnab, for taking care of that for me. I appreciate it a great deal. Um, <laughs> what I will say, and I wanna make sure that I don't miss any names, is that um, this has been a really wonderful year and a really great group of students to work with, and I wanna take a moment to recognize our seniors who are gonna be embarking on their new uh, careers just in a couple of weeks. We'll all be wrapped up with our spring semester. Um, Ashwin, Harshi, Josh, Matthew, and Tomas have all been leaders in this organization uh, in a variety of different ways, and we really wouldn't be the same without them. So can I get a round of applause? There's two more students that I would also like to recognize because they've been awarded the uh, OHIO Leadership Scholarship this year, uh, and that is Amber, our lead for this evening. Action. Go ahead, stand up. Let us clap for you. <laughs> Thank you guys very much. Very much. You are outstanding leaders. You deserve every cent of the scholarship, and I hope that you put it to good use. 
So now is the time that you guys have all been waiting for. We're going to announce the winner. I'm going to invite uh, one of our OHO alumni, Caitlin Horn, up here to reveal the big secret. Thank you so much for coming out to Show Ohio tonight. My name is Caitlin Horn, uh, and I am the founding president of the alumni of OHIO. And I am so thrilled that you all made it out to see the remarkable innovation pre presented here tonight. OHIO is a remarkable organization whose key accomplishment is fostering an incredible tech community here in Columbus, Ohio. As alumni, we are trying to build a, a network to help support each other and current students as they become alumni. Um, to help join and, you know, uh, go out and build even more incredible things out in the future. Uh, that being said, I would also <laughs> like to take a moment to recognize the incredible organizers of this event. Uh, well done. Uh, this is really impressive and you should all be very proud of yourself. Um, and yeah, well, without further ado, <laughs> yes, you can clap. Yes, well, without further ado, I would like to recognize the winner and invite them to come up and say a few words as well. And the winner of tonight's event is Artemis. Artemis Prime and basically we were in autonomous drone surveillance and the whole purpose was this to make low-cost consumer drones and also add object detection and artificial intelligence to it to make sure that our campus is safe off campus and on campus. So I have a couple of videos if you guys came to our booth we had object detection that detects people and also objects such as cars, buildings and other stuff. Right now we're in the process of creating and adding more to our data set to identify other threats and objects as well. Yeah, got a little bit on topic, but thank you so much. This, is, this means a lot, uh, I'm Pranav. We really came up with this at Make Ohio, so props to, I guess, Cal for like having hosting such a great event. Um, and props to Clayton as well, he's kind of over there. He's like, he helped us at like three in the morning kind of helping sort out our drone issues, but this is really a great opportunity to kind of take an idea from start and kind of just immediately start and just kind of run from the get-go, I guess. Yeah. Congratulations, Artemis. That is so exciting. And that really concludes Show Ohio this year. So uh, we will be wrapping at like 8.30. Thank you all so much for coming this year. I hope you all had a wonderful time. Wrap up, make those last connections. And yeah, thank you all so much.